Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. When I was growing up, I used to play with the girl that lived behind me. Her name was Amy. And Amy and I would go on lots of adventures through our backyards together. And since she was a year older and much worldlier than I was, Amy would teach me about the wonders of the world. She showed me how to pull apart purple clover flowers and suck the sweet nectar out of them. She taught me how to climb a tree. She taught me that if you write on your own garage with dandelion flowers, it won't stain, which we later learned wasn't true at all. <laughs> So then Amy tried to teach me to play dumb, which didn't work very well since it was my name that was scrawled across the back of the garage. So then, thanks to Amy, I learned how to paint. On one particular summer afternoon, Amy and I were scouring our yards for magical wonders, and we came upon a child's most prized treasure, a real live caterpillar. We both squealed with delight and took turns letting it crawl up and down our arms. Then Amy declared, we've got to find a safe place to keep him. And being a naive six-year-old, I looked to my older friend to come up with the best option. I know, she shouted, I have the most perfect thing, a shoebox. So we took her shoebox, we put some grass and leaves and a stick inside it, we poked a few holes in the cover, and we put our precious pet inside and left the box on the patio table. Now he'll be perfectly safe, she said. Nothing can get him in there. Well, it turned out that the nothing she referred to had black fur, a tail, and teeth, and was named Doc. When we went inside for a snack, Doc, her dog, tore the box to shreds and ate our precious treasure and promptly refunded the expired treasure on the patio, which we then had to clean off with a hose. I learned from that experience that you need to choose your storage vessels wisely. You don't store chicken noodle soup in a mailing envelope. You don't keep fireflies in Tupperware, and you don't keep your diary in the desk that you share with your little sister, for instance. The vessels you choose to hold important things matter. Yet in our reading today, Paul says, but we have this treasure in clay jars. What would you store in clay jars? Maybe coins? A lot of piggy banks are made of clay. But have you ever dropped a clay piggy bank? It's all the scurrying and picking up fun that you've had after beating down a pinata without getting any candy out of the deal. It's a big mess. You can plant things in clay pots, but the pots are prone to cracking and chipping. I keep garlic in a clay pot, but I doubt that that's the kind of treasure that Paul is talking about. So what is this treasure? Gold, diamonds, money? Nope. So what treasure does Paul tell us we have in jars of clay? Well, Paul's writing to the Corinthians following a difficult time, a time of conflict and strife. They had suffered and struggled and fought and wondered if things would ever be all right. So Paul's giving them encouragement, reminding them of the treasure that keeps them going in the toughest times. He talks a lot about light shining in our hearts, light shining out of the darkness, which reminds me of the song, This Little Light of Mine. So think back to that song with me. The little light that we have, are we supposed to hide it under a bushel basket? No, we're supposed to, are we supposed to let Satan it out? No, what are we supposed to do? Let it shine, exactly. And what is this light that we're shining, exactly? The light is the light of Christ, the gospel, the story of salvation. And now Paul's talking about keeping that treasure in clay jars. That's kind of confusing. Keeping any light in an opaque jar would be ill-advised if we want anybody to see the light, not to mention the light of Jesus. 
But what if instead of thinking about literal clay jars, we realize that Paul is talking about something else entirely? Something as fragile, as breakable as clay jars. What happens if we understand that Paul is saying that we are the jars of clay? I'm not sure that we like that imagery. Clay starts off as slimy, kind of a lump of soil, not even rich soil, not much can grow in clay. In fact, clay isn't good for much until somebody takes a lump of it and smushes and sculpts or spins it into something useful or beautiful. And even then, it can be pushed right back into that same lump again. Unless you fire it at very high temperatures, the heat makes clay harder and more permanent but it also becomes brittle, easy to chip and break. Sure, clay pottery can be beautiful and elegant. It has some very practical purposes, but I don't think we like to think of ourselves as fragile or brittle. We like to think of ourselves as strong, maybe something like granite or steel. But still, Paul is calling us jars of clay. And I suppose if we're honest with ourselves, we remember that God created humans from the dust, and to dust we shall return. We maybe realize that we feel a little lumpy sometimes and a little useless at other times. We realize that sometimes we are moldable, sometimes we're firm, sometimes we feel like we're that clay on a potter's wheel spinning out of control. And sometimes the heat and pressure of our lives are like a kiln hardening us, making us a little rougher, maybe a little stronger, so we can weather the forces that we'll encounter in life. So what was Paul really saying? What does it mean that we're clay jars? Well, it means that despite the sculpting and kneading and spinning and molding and trials we have been through, Despite our vulnerability and how fragile we are in the grand scheme of things, despite our thin skin, our chips, our scratches and broken pieces, despite the fact that we might be sometimes considered cracked pots, God has chosen to put his gospel in us. God has chosen us as vessels to hold and pour out God's grace on the world. Now, our world would say, that's ridiculous. Why would a mighty God choose such fragile, broken, sinful vessels to bring his good news to the world? If God's word is so important for the world to hear, why wouldn't God choose a mighty, unbreakable, undefeatable vessel that couldn't fail? That's because that's not who our God is. God could have chosen to bring his message through armies of warriors clad in armor with unbreakable weapons, undefeatable powers. God could have sent legions of angels and heavenly hosts to proclaim his word and to demand our worship. But instead, God sent into this world a jar of clay like us. God sent his own son, a real-life human being with bones that could break, with skin that could bruise, with flesh that could bleed. And indeed, Jesus came not just to teach us how to live, not just to heal the broken, not just to show the power of God, but to be broken, to be bruised, to be pierced and killed for the sake of the world. Many people throughout history have criticized Christianity, saying, that's ridiculous. What kind of God would send his son to die? That's cruel. God isn't supposed to be weak. God is strong. But what they don't understand is that our God chose weakness. God chose humanity. God chose vulnerability in order to accomplish something greater than anyone could imagine. God's strength came not through armies and wars, but through weakness, the weakness of Jesus' mortal body on the cross. Through Jesus' death, the power of human sin is also put to death. We're given forgiveness of our sins. But that wasn't the end of the story. On that Easter morning, God demonstrated his power by not letting death have the last word. 
God raised Jesus to new life, defeating the power of death, not through armies or swords, but through Jesus' own death and resurrection. Jesus' resurrection means resurrection for us. Jesus, too, came to this earth as a clay jar, a jar of God's grace. And his whole life, death, and resurrection were Jesus pouring God's grace down into us. So though we humans are flawed and cracked, chipped and fragile vessels, God pours out his grace into us. Think about that. God entrusts us with his gospel. God uses us through our brokenness to bring good news to a broken world. Our imperfections make us perfect messengers of God's grace in this imperfect world. And when God pours his grace into us, we're not just called to hold on to that grace. We're not just called to let the gospel just slosh around inside of us, keeping it to ourselves. We're called to let it overflow to others, sharing God's love in our words and actions, forgiving and welcoming others, blessing others, telling people how God has changed our lives by using us despite our flaws. God has chosen you to share his love with the world. God has chosen you, my beautiful, imperfect clay jars. And if God has chosen you to share his love with others, who are you to say, not me? Amen. <laughs>